Nobody back there? Is it running? I saw it was live. Yeah, we are live. Dan is running. Dan is running. You guys are both. Yep, we're live. Yeah. We're ready. All right. Good evening, everybody. If you would, uh, stand and turn with in your hymnals to 211. 211. 211. Yep. 211. Let's just praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Amen. Now if you turn to hymn number 258, 258. Oh, how I love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing this word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. I got it. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Verse 2. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Verse 4. It tells of one whose loving heart can fill my deepest woe. Who in each sorrow bears a part. There's none can compare below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Well, amen. Thank you. Now we have welcome and prayer. Amen. Well, I want to welcome everybody here tonight. It's been a great day, amen. I'm glad you came back after this morning. I didn't think anybody was going to come back after this morning, but uh, I'm glad you came back for part two of this morning's message. And uh, I guarantee that you're going to get a lot out of it because this is the part where everybody should be listening to. And uh, it's going to be good uh, tonight. But let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for all you've done for us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for <clears throat> dying on the cross for our sins. Pray for those who aren't with us tonight. We just pray, Lord, that you bring them back next week. Father, we thank you so much for all you've done for us. Be with us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, if you will, turn with me to hymn number 246. 246. We're in the twos tonight. Hey. 246. Higher ground. Two forty six. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table and a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Verse 2. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where there's a bound, my prayer and my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table and a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Verse 4. I want to scale the utmost height 
and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I pray till heaven I found. Lord, let me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. By faith on heaven's table in a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Amen. That was wonderful. Uh, do we have any praises tonight? Any praises? Yes, Norm. Always good. Yep. Amen. Yes, he is. He's good. Yes. Yeah. Well, Dad, I, I guess you tried to give a praise uh, Wednesday, and I, I missed it. I'm sorry. That wasn't on purpose. I know. <laughs> Still a praise, though? <laughs> no. Anybody else? Yes, Miss Stone. <laughs> yeah, good. Good. Yes. Oh, no. Oh, wow. Yes, Brother Timothy. Yep. Yep. Rob. Amen. Yep. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? No. Okay, well, I have lots to praise about. Uh, good family, good church family, uh, terrible job. That's a praise. That's a praise because I have a job. <laughs> At a house, roof over the head, new cows coming. No, not yet. That'll be next year. Uh, kids' vehicles are broke down. I got to go get it here in just a little bit. They're on the 79 and 60, so I have to leave here and go fetch them home. Uh, but they're my kids. I love them. That's a praise. <laughs> uh, oh, well, with that, we'll hit the announcements. Uh, today happens to be Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to anybody I may not have said it to yet today. Uh, June 26th is Teens Under God's Guidance. June 27th be movie night at 7 p.m. right here. June 28th is Noisy Bucket. July 1st, Question and Answers. July 4th is a men's breakfast right here at 8 o'clock. Well, not here, but down below. But that's uh, July 5th is Patriotic Sunday. July 10th is Teens Under God's Guidance. July 18th, Men's and Ladies Fellowship. July 19th is a church picnic. July 24th is Teens Under God's Guidance. July 26th is Noisy Bucket, and that's our announcements. Now, if we hit the course of the month, 261, please stand, turn to hymn number 261. We'll sing our course, and we'll do our offering. 261. He's able, he's able, I know he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able, he's able, I know he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He healed the brokenhearted and set the captives free. He made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. He's able, he's able, I know he's able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. Amen. Say hi, everybody. We need two for offering.
One more time. He's able, he's able, I know he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able, he's able, I know he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He healed the brokenhearted and set the captives free. He made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. He's able, he's able, I know he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. One more song before the message. If you'll turn with me to hymn number 238. Two, three, and then uh, that's eight. <laughs> 238. 238. You stay seated for this one. 238. What is this one? I'm so happy in Christ today that I'm going along my way. Yes, I'm so happy to know and say Jesus included me too. Jesus included me. Yes, he included me. When the Lord said whosoever, he included me. Jesus included me. Yes, he included me. When the Lord said, Whosoever, he included me. Verse 2. Gladly I read whosoever. Um, yeah, verse 2. Yeah, you want to come give me? Yeah. Because I lost my ear. I was trying to fake it. I know the chorus. I don't know. <laughs> 238. Yep. I was lip syncing to him. I, I did have it. Oh, <laughs> you don't know? Okay, here we go. Now, verse 2. Yep. Really, I read who's who's Come to the forge of life today. But when I read it, I always say, Jesus included me too. Jesus included me. Yes, he included me. When the Lord said, Whosoever, he included me. Jesus included me. Yes, he included me. When the Lord said, Whosoever, he included me. Amen. I think we'll, we'll cut it off on that. Though. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. I don't want to mess it up too bad. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> No, no, it was mine. I should uh, I, I should know that one. I know the chorus. Thirty-eight. I tell you what, by next Sunday I'll know it. And now we have a message, from Pastor Storm. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what. I've got some praises. I uh, <coughs> had that funeral on Friday, and uh, did the um, gave an invitation, Lord's Prayer. We had 25 people raise their hand that they said the Lord's Prayer. 25. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, if they only meant what they said, you know, there'd be 25 more people in heaven. And um, so the one I did yesterday, we didn't have any. But um, then again, you never know. 
Um, so turn in your Bibles tonight to 1 Samuel chapter 5, or 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7. We looked at chapter 3 this morning, or 2 this morning, and tonight we're going to be looking at chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter number 7. <clears throat> this is part 2 of a two-part message. Part 1 this is this morning. And if you want to know what I said this morning and what I preached on this morning, you have to go to the website and watch it there. Amen? And uh, that's one thing nice about having technology. It's on the website. And uh, so you'll have to go there and watch it. And I just appreciate Dana. He's running the uh, live stream tonight from home. And uh, I'm just so glad that he's able to do that. But uh, we're going to start at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 7. We're going to be starting at verse 15. <clears throat> it says, And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went <clears throat> from year to year in the circuit to Bethel and to Gilgal and to Mizbeth and, and judged Israel in all these places. And he returned, and his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today. We thank you for all that you've done for us. I just pray now that you'll guide and direct everything that's said and done here. That'll be for your honor and your glory. We love you. We thank you for what you've done for us. I just pray now that you'll guide and direct. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you know, this is part two of a two-part message. Usually I don't do this, but I said this morning I started on it, and I got 16 pages of notes, and I thought, eh, that's a little bit too much for the morning. And because I normally go through eight pages of notes when I preach. And so I thought, well, it's going to be a two-parter. So we're going to have two parts, one part this morning, one part tonight. But in part one, we went, <clears throat> we saw that Eli had done wrong with his two sons. We saw that he did not raise his sons correctly. And we saw that he tried to correct them when they were old, but it was too late. Then we saw that God was going to take both of them. Now, <clears throat> tonight we're just going to take and go over a little overview of what's happened since then. But we know that, that uh, Samuel had a dream, and, and the dream in the dream that uh, uh, God told him that, that uh, Eli and his two sons were going to die. And Samuel was the one who had to break the news to Eli that him and his sons were going to die. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to do that, especially to my mentor. But then again, that's exactly what he had to do. And it was not long, and there was a war with the Philistines and both Hopni and Phineas. And Eli, all three died in the same day. Hopni and Phineas died in the war, and um, the Philistines had taken the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, uh, when um, Eli heard that, he fell off his chair backwards. And he broke his neck, the Bible says, because he was heavy. That meant he was fat. That means he was doing just what his boys were doing and taking too much to eat. Amen? Now, so that's kind of where we're going to pick up tonight. Because um, um, we know that Eli is gone, his sons are gone. And God had told uh, Samuel that uh, Eli's um, family would never again, ever be allowed to be judges in Israel. And so here we see that uh, Samuel is uh, picked up from there. <clears throat> and uh, this is part two of, uh, we're going to look a little bit at the life of Samuel tonight and his two sons, which he had and how they turned out after he was raised by Eli. Now, Samuel saw everything that happened to Eli and his sons, didn't he? And he was raised under Eli. He knew exactly what to do. And now we're going to take a look at Samuel. Now, Elijah, I'm preaching tonight. You're not, okay? And, uh, but uh, we're going to take a look at that tonight. But, you know, in verse 1 of chapter 8, we're going to be in chapter 8, you know, all night tonight. So if you want to go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, that's where we're going to be. But in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now here, there's been a time period 
between chapter 7 and chapter 8. Many commentators feel that there was between 60 and 65 years between the end of chapter 7 and the start of chapter 8. So in that little space there that says um, uh, chapter 7, verse 17, and it says chapter 8, there was a span of 65 years in that much. And it reminded me of the message I preached yesterday at a funeral about the little dash between the time you're born and the time you die. And that right there in that little space there was all of the 65 years of Samuel's life. That's all we know about it, is that little space right there. Now, what we're going to look at is here we have um, Samuel, who was used by God all the days um, from the time Eli was, was dead until now. Samuel was not a young man anymore. <clears throat> um, he was used by God, and he, he judged the uh, uh, people of Israel you know, all of this time period. His life was um, going before him, and he could no longer do the things that he wanted to do or used to do. You know, he uh, was much slower uh, in his steps. Um, he was slower in the things that he did. And Samuel, because of his age, he had his sons uh, become judges over Israel. Now, um, we remember back in Eli, or we remember this morning, that Eli had made his two sons judges. Remember that? Eli had made his two sons judges, Hophni and Phinehas, and they were judging the people of Israel because Eli was old in age, and he was slowing down. And when the, the high priest got old, he would make his sons the next priests. And then one of them, after his death, would become the high priest, usually the oldest son. And that's why sometimes they only had two children. But there's a, some other reasons why, um, and we're going to go into that in just a minute. But <clears throat> here we see that, that um, um, the high priest... You know, he, uh, um, when he got up in years, they usually named their sons as the next priest. Now, we need to realize that it's very interesting that the high priest were married. You notice that? They were married. Not only were they married, but they had children. They weren't syllabate. Uh, you know, they, 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 had, uh, they had families. If you even go into the New Testament, you look at the heads of the early church, they were married and had families. You know, some of these religions that say they're, they can't get married is, you know, I don't, anyway. But here we see that they were. Now, I want to take a look at verse 2. It says, <clears throat> Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abiah. They were judges in the Sheba, Beersheba. Now, what we need to realize that it's, Kind of interesting that Samuel had two sons and Eli had two sons. Both of them had two sons. Now, Eli had Hophni and Phinehas. And here we see that Samuel had Joel and Abiah. Now, many of these families of the day had many offspring. They had a lot of children. But the high priest didn't. The high priest only had just a couple of sons. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, they're on the road a lot. After all, if you looked at the circuit in uh, verses 15 to 17 that Samuel uh, did in chapter 7, you'll see that he had to go from place to place on a circuit every year and judge the people of Israel. He was gone from home. He was kind of like an evangelist. You know, gets in his mortar home and the way he goes. Amen? You know, he went from place to place judging. Well, he wasn't home. A lot of these places were miles away from where he was but the interesting thing is that if in verse 17 it says that he went back home to his hometown and that was when he was getting older when he couldn't go to all these other towns anymore he came home and that's where he settled down and he judged israel from there now here we see that he made his children the high priest now his sons Let's take a look at verse 3. 
Verse 3, it says, And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes, and per, uh, prevented judgment. Or perverted judgment, I'm sorry. Uh, then all the elders of the Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel in Ramoth. Now, this is very interesting, and you got to take and you got to you got to see this. Now, <laughs> Samuel's sons, I believe, were raised right. I really do. I believe that Samuel's sons were raised better than Eli's sons. I believe that they um, went to. You know, probably went to Ramoth Baptist Academy. You know, I believe they, you know, they had a good Christian background. I believe that they uh, uh, were taught right. I believe that they were in church every Saturday morning. And they were there every day that the church doors were open. I believe that their dad taught them exactly how the sacrifices had to be done and why they had to be done that way. I believe that they were taught... Um, the, the feasts and, and the sacrifices, and, and uh, they needed to be done decently and in order. You know, their dad, I believe, taught them how to judge the people correctly. And they knew exactly how to do it, what to do it, and when to do it. And I believe that Samuel taught them everything that they needed to know. Why do I believe that? Because Samuel had grew up under Eli. He saw everything that happened to Hopni and Phineas. He saw how Hopni and Phineas had went the way of the world. He saw how God had chastised them. He saw exactly what God had told uh, Samuel about his sons. He heard what Samuel told them about how they were doing things wrong and they needed to turn from their wicked ways. He heard all of that. And I believe that Samuel was smart enough to teach his children differently. After all, Samuel was the one that had the vision from God that God told him that Hopni and Phineas and Eli we're all going to die. And I believe wholeheartedly that Samuel wanted to raise his family in the nurture and admiration of the Lord. Because he knew if there was going to be any more priests that came out, it was going to have to be by his family. Because Eli's family couldn't have any priests in the priesthood. Because God had ordained that. Now, I believe that he saw exactly what God had done with Eli and Eli's sons. And I believe that Samuel wanted to raise his children the right way. Samuel, he wanted his family always to be in the priesthood. I believe that Samuel really enjoyed being the high priest. After all, he got all the perks in life. He did. He got the best of everything. Because he was the high priest. He got to go into the Holy of Holies once a year and sprinkle the, the blood seven times on, on the mercy seat. And one thing that showed me that he was a godly man was this. God did not strike him dead when he went into the Holy of Holies every year to sprinkle that blood. If he was not holy, he would have been struck dead. But he, every year he went in and he placed that blood on the altar. You know, Samuel grew up under the sins of Eli's sons. And he saw exactly what they had done wrong and how they had done things unpleasing to God. You know, they disobeyed God in so many ways. And Samuel, I believe his sons, were taught right. They did everything the way it was supposed to be when they were younger. But Samuel got old. His sons got older. 
All of a sudden, verse 3 comes along, and his sons walked not in the ways of their dad. They said, nah, we're not going to take and do it their way, his way. There's a better way. We can get rich. We can do anything we want. Why? Because we're the high priest's sons. We can sin all we want. We can live in the world. You know, they followed the boo scene. They followed the fast money, the easy way in life. They did everything contrary to the way that they had been brought up. Listen, they did not go to Ramoth Baptist Bible College either. Did you know that? They did not go there. They probably didn't go into any college at all. But you know, they followed their emotions instead of following the way they were taught. You know, they, they did not feel that their dad knew anything. After all, he was in church all the time. He didn't have any idea what life was all about. You know, all he did is judge the people. He was in church and judged the people all the time. That's all he ever did. He never went out and partied. He never went out and did this. He never went out and did that. He didn't know how to live. Amen? That's what they were thinking. You know, I want you to listen very carefully to this. I believe that there's a time in every young person's life when they have to make life's decisions on their own. I believe that there's a time in every child's life when they get to a certain point, they have to make a decision on which road they're going to take. Are they going to take the narrow road or are they going to take the interstate? Which road are they going to take? And it's going to be up to them to make the decision. It's not going to be up to you and I. It wasn't up to Samuel for him to make the decision of the boys because he would have made the right decision. But they made their own choice. You know that nobody beats us over the head to go in sin, do they? We go into sin by ourselves. We go into sin all by ourselves, and we usually try to take somebody with us. But, you know, they chose the wrong road. You know, it's up to the parents to train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, have you ever really looked at that verse? Train up a child in the way he shall go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. What age will they not depart from it? 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100? It says when they're old. What's old? Now, in Susan's case, it was 12, but... Um, I know. But what we need to realize is Old is not defined in that verse. Old could be any, any age to anybody. But you know, it's up to the parents to keep children on the right roads all the time that they're growing up. So that when they get to a certain age, when they do have to make their own decision, on which road they need to go, they go, wait a minute, hold it. I was told by a preacher that if I go this way, this will happen. I was told by mom and dad, if I go this way, I could really get into some bad trouble. So I'm going to go this way. You know, it's up to the parents to have their children in church every time the doors of the church are open. If parents are going to teach their children how to go down the right road, the first place they need to do is teach them to be in church. People say, well, they don't have to be in church. 
I want you to listen to my devotions this week. I have five devotions this week, Monday through Friday, and I've got them all outlined. I stayed up last night and worked on them. I worked on them all afternoon, and I've got them all outlined, five of them. And one of them is really, really good. It's on having fellowship. Having fellowship. And uh, you want to take and make sure you listen to that one. I can't remember exactly what day it is, but listen to all of them. You'll catch it, okay? Yeah. But... <clears throat> In Proverbs 22, 6, it says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. We talked about that. But all we as parents can do is to teach our children. That's it. You know, now, Brother Hulk, Holcomb, he's a little bit different. <clears throat> and the reason he's a little bit different is because Kevin doesn't live too far away from him, and if Kevin gets out of line, he can still get him. Amen? But you know what? My kids live a long ways away, 3,000 miles. I can't keep track of them, even though I'd like to. But I can't. But listen, we need stink. Well, I don't need perfume. I love Elijah. Elijah, right in the middle of the service, can just disrupt everything. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> but listen, what we need to realize is this, is that the time to teach our children is not when they're in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. In fact, the time is not right even to try to teach your children at 14 to 18. Because from 14 to 18... All teenagers are brain dead. Amen. Brain dead mean that you don't know a whole lot. Your brain just kind of goes to sleep at that time period, Molly. <laughs> but the responsibility of which road a young person is going to take is going to be up to them. You know... Are they going to follow the things of the world? Are they going to dress like the world? Are they going to listen to the music of the world? Are they going to look at the videos of the world? Are they going to do the drugs of the world? Are they going to do the drink of the world? Are they going to have the friends of the world? Or, if need be, are they willing to stand alone? Because I'll tell you what, that's what we need right now, is we need teenagers who are willing to stand alone, especially with what's going on in all of our cities today. With all the protests that are going on, and all the rioting, and the looting, and everything else that's going on, we need Christian kids that will stand alone and say, No! I'm not going to do that! I'll stand alone if I have to. We need young men and young women who will stand up and be counted for the cause of Christ. We need parents and grandparents who will teach their children the things of God, not only important, but they're the most important thing that they can have in their life. You know, there's consequences for our children not taking the right paths. You know, think about this for just a minute. Here's Samuel's children that chose the wrong path. They chose it on their own. Dad did not teach them that way. Dad taught them right, and yet they chose the wrong path. Let's take a look at verses 4 and 5 of chapter 8. It says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Whoa. Uh-oh. Not good. Not good. Here comes the elders of Israel all the way to Ramah. I can see this caravan of camels and donkeys heading for Ramah. They came to Samuel's house. 
Now, I don't know how big of a parking lot he had outside or anything else, but I know it was not big enough to hold everybody. He came out, they sat down, and they had a little powwow. Now, here we see that the people did not want his children to judge them because they were not judging fairly. They were taking money under the table. They were taking bribes. They were drunk half the time. They were out running with women who weren't their wives. They did not want them to be the judges that would judge the children of Israel. They felt God could somehow raise up someone who could be king over them. They felt that they knew of a better way than what Samuel did. They wanted to be like everyone else. They wanted someone to make the decisions for them because they saw how bad Samuel's kids turned out. Wow. Was it Samuel's fault? No. It wasn't Samuel's fault. I believe that Samuel taught them in the way that they should go. It was their choice that got them to where they were. Now, you've got to follow me on this, folks, because I'll tell you what, this is where we are right now. This is where we are right now living. And I want you to understand that. Here we see that they felt that God could maybe raise up somebody else. They wanted a king like everybody else did. They wanted someone to make the decisions for them. They wanted an army who would fight their battles. They wanted someone who would give diplomacy to their communities. They did not feel Samuel could do it anymore because of his age, and they did not want his drunk sons doing it. Wow. Where are we at right now, folks? What's happening in Seattle? What's happening in California? What's happening in Atlanta, Georgia? What's happening in Chicago? What's happening in Minnesota? Now, this is the thing that I find so interesting. Minneapolis said, no, we don't want any police protection. The police officers can just lock up. Yesterday, there was 11 murders in one place. And there was no police protection whatsoever to come and help out. Now the people are screaming, where's the police? Where's the police? Where's the police? You said you didn't want them, so they aren't here. You know what? Didn't they do that with God? Didn't they say, we don't want you in the schools. We don't want you in the workplaces. We don't want you anywhere. Get out. So he did. What happened? We had shooting in the school. We had mass murders in the school. Businesses are going down. Why? Because God's not there anymore. We need to realize that we need a new generation that's going to stand up for what's right. Yeah, you know, I, I get so upset sometimes. I, I, I can't even watch the news anymore. I just can't. You know, Fox used to be halfway decent. I can't even watch that one. So now I'm trying to get one news on. And uh, one news is the only one that tells it like it is. And uh, I haven't found it yet, but I'm going to get there. But, you know, they felt that they needed someone who they could put trust in other than God. Because of the unloyalty of Samuel's sons. Wow. Think about that. Because of Samuel's sons, they were looking for a better way. Because they were not trained in the way they should go, 
all of the people are looking for something different. I look at the world we live in today and I look at the younger generation. How many of those were brought up in church? How many of their parents were brought up in church? Oh, their grandparents maybe were, but we've lost three generations of people. Three generations. I look at my generation. I'm from the 60s and 70s. That's where a lot of this started. You know, I was small then. I was, you know, just a snot-nosed brat. But, you know, we had the hippie movement. We had the love and peace movement. You know, that's where a lot of this got started. And it, you know what? If parents would have stood up then and gave their kids a good whooping and told them, you need to take and get a head on your shoulders, we may not be where we are today. Because, listen, their children... And their children's children are what is causing this to happen now. How old are you? Yeah. 15? Huh? You're going to be 15? Oh, you're going to be 16? When? Are you sure? Do you want to make it? No. No, okay, she's 15 years old. I don't know if you saw the, the, uh, the protest they had yesterday in Phoenix. The leader of the protest was a 15-year-old girl. Think about this for a minute. They had up to 2,000 people that were marching behind her, and she was the leader of the protest. What does she know? Nothing. Where's your mom and dad? They ought to have a good whooping themselves. Amen? You know, Samuel is displeased about this. Look at verse 6. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. You know, I want you to understand some things. The man of God takes things personal when the people of God don't want to trust his judgment. That's just the way it is. When there are accusations made against the church, the ministries of the church, or even people who come to the church... The man of God takes it personal as a personal attack on him because you are part of me. After all, I'm the under-shepherd of this church. Samuel was no different. He felt the people had just betrayed him. He did. He felt the people had just betrayed him. And that they did not feel he had done a good job. Now, how long a period of time did I say it was between verse 17 and verse 1? 65 years. 65 years. He judged the people for 65 years. And now they're coming and they're throwing it in his face. Samuel was really down for the last 60 to 65 years or so, he had given his life to the work of God. He had sacrificed all he could for the children of Israel. Even his family had went through time and time again of things because dad was high priest. The many hours that he spent, not only in the tabernacle, but also judging the people. The blood and sweat and tears that he shed over the people. He felt that they had all turned on him. Do you know why this happened? 
there was a new generation that came in in that 65 years. There was a new generation that crept up in that 65 years from the time Eli died to now. Now he felt betrayed by the very people that he loved and he worked with. Samuel doesn't realize that it wasn't him that the people were upset with. It wasn't him. It's that they were upset with God. It's that they're upset with God. <laughs> I heard a story today. Um, there was a guy that said this, told this story this afternoon. It was about two preachers. Each of the, each of the two preachers, they um, graduated from the same school, same year, same time. Both of them graduated from the same college, same day. One of them took church A, one of them took church B. Ten years later, both of them were in the same churches. Both of them were celebrating their 10-year anniversary. And they called each other. They kept up with one another once in a while. And they called each other because it was their 10-year anniversary. The guy in church A, he's, oh, man, we had such a big day today. We had 25 saved, and we had all these baptisms, and we had a great big fellowship in the fellowship hall. And, and he says, you know what? He says, the people gave me a brand new car. He says, oh, what a blessing. What a blessing to be here. He says, how was your day? And the preacher there of the church, he says, well, he said, um, mine wasn't quite that, that good. He said, we didn't have anybody saved. Didn't have any baptisms. And he says, after the service, he says, we had just a little get together. And he says, you know what? He says, the people gave me a crock pot. The people gave me a crock pot. He says, after 10 years of being in, going to the hospital with them, after 10 years of burying their loved ones, after 10 years of seeing their children being born and dedicating their children, after 10 years of baptizing people, after 10 years of blood, sweat, and tears, he says, all I got was a crock pot. He says, my wife is so mad. She told me, she says, we need to get out of this church. I can't go back to the church anymore. I am so upset by the people. And he says, you know, he says, I have a good notion to turn in my resignation. He says, what do you think I should do? And the guy from church A said this. He says, you don't deserve the crock pot. You don't deserve the crock pot. I'll tell you what. That really kind of hit home to me. Do I deserve the crock pot? You know, how do I feel about the people in this church? How do I feel about the things that go on here? So this guy said, you know what, he says, my wife and I, after I gave that message, he says, people started giving us crockpots. <laughs> and he said, one lady gave us this small little tiny crockpot. He says, it's so small you couldn't even cook anything in it. He says, we have that on the shelf. And he said, when things start going bad, she'll look at me and she'll say, you having a crockpot day? And he says, when things get going bad with her, I look at her and I go, you having a crock pot day? And you know what? I have to say it more than she does. <laughs> we need to realize something. Sometimes, and this is where, this is where, the reason I use that is that's right where Samuel is right now. He's having a crock pot day. He's feeling really down and out because he feels the people are upset with him. But they weren't. They are were upset with God. They didn't feel that God 
would take care of them anymore. You know, as I look at the faces of those who are protesting, I don't see any love of the Lord Jesus Christ in their eyes. All I see is hate in the love of someone else, not God. You know, if we as parents did not teach and train our children in the way that they should go, believe me, this next generation will be in captivity. I saw a guy yesterday at the funeral, and I have not seen this guy for probably close to 15 years. He moved away, and he just came back for the funeral yesterday. And this is what he said to me. He says, Pastor Storm, he says, do you preach the way you always did? I said, yep. He says, good. He says, I can remember the messages you preached back then, and it's all coming to pass now. He says, I can remember you saying that this and this and this and this is going to happen unless we get right with God and get back on our knees and pray. And he says, that's exactly what's happening today. The exact same thing. I'm thinking to myself, man, that guy's got a better memory than I do because I can't remember any messages. We need to realize is we need to train our children. You know, Samuel is really down and out. You know, he went to God. He's, oh God, please, please, please help me. I want you to look at verses 7 and 8. This will be closing, kind of. Well, I guess I got a couple. Verses 7 and 8, it says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken, not, hearken unto the words of the people in all they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done, since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Whoa. Man. I'll tell you what. When you get down, God always tries to bring you back up. God tells Samuel, you listen, the people have rejected me, not you. They've turned their back on me and they've went into sin. God tells Samuel that it heartless of the people or the hardness of the people's hearts that is causing them to turn away from him. This is not the first time that they've turned their backs on God. This is not the first time they looked at other gods. And God has just about had enough of them. You know, I believe that at the end of Samuel's life, he said to himself, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Why did my children turn out the way they did? You know, we need to realize we as parents have an awesome responsibility to raise our children in the way that they need to go. And God, I guarantee, will bring them back when they're old. But if we don't train them when they're young, they're lost. We need to remember that we need to train up our children today. If we don't, there may not be a tomorrow. We need a new generation. We need a God-fearing people. And if we can get one, I guarantee that we're going to have maybe four more years of prosperity. If not, it could get bad.
Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the part two of this. I just pray now that you'll help us and guide us, help us to realize that we have an awesome responsibility, and that's to train our children in the way that they should go. Father, so many times we think that we know a better way to train our children, and we do not look to you to help us. There's no way we can take and train our children in the society we live in today by ourselves. We need your help. I just pray now that you'll go before us, guide us, and direct us in all that we do and say, and we'll give the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I'm going to let you go. God bless. Have a great week, and we'll see you all on Wednesday night. <clears throat> thanks, Dana, for live streaming.